we think always of China in Western terms, through a Western prism. We expect and require China to be like us. We impose our hierarchy of values on China, and when China is found wanting, as it always is in these terms, we are very negative about China. Now, this way of thinking really won't do. It's ignorant, and it's also deeply respect, disrespectful towards you know, a remarkable civilization, historically speaking. So what I want to do in my first little talk, before my elaboration, God knows what that is, but we'll find out, um, is to introduce you to three concepts by which to try and understand China. You know, we can't, at the moment we try and we insist that China is to be understood through Western, in terms of Western history, uh, Western experience, and Western concepts. Sorry, but you can't do it that way. So, First of all, my first idea to, I want to introduce you to is um, Chinese civilization. Now, for the last century or so, China has called itself a nation state. But if you pause for a moment and think about that, then you know it's obvious that that's uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg of Chinese history because China. Uh, well, the Chinese refer to China as we are a product of 5,000 years of, of, of history. Uh, but certainly, for the last two, China's existed for the last 2,000 years. Now, you're going to cheer me at this point and say, wow, that's a great science. Hooray! Hooray! Hmm? Hooray! Hooray! So um, th this is this Kruger is that that yellow uh, shaded area um, was the Qing Dynasty at the end of the Warring State period. In the Warring State period, China was divided into countless states. But in, in 211 BC, the Qing the Qing Emperor conquered the rest of the, these states and there emerged the Qin Dynasty. That's 2,000 years ago. And if you come still uh, to just, just under, just around about 2,000 years ago, the subsequent dynasty started a lot longer with the Han Dynasty. And the remarkable thing about this, as you can see, is, is that the Han Dynasty, already 2,000 years ago, was already beginning to be, uh, you know, resembles part of modern China. The, the great majority of Chinese live in the eastern part of China, some of the central. And you can see that the, the, the Han uh, Empire already was uh, not, you know, was almost uh, synonymous with the uh, eastern half uh, of uh, China. So China is 2,000 years old. And what is fascinating about China is for the Chinese, their sense of what China is and what it means to be Chinese is not a function of the last 100 years of being a nation state or the last 150 years or having exactly what to count it. It is a function of at least 2,000 years of civilization. So, what are the things that define being Chinese for the Chinese? They are Confucian values. They are a very unusual, extremely unusual relationship between the state and society. They are a very distinctive notion of the family. Um, they are a social custom like Guanxi. You know, China is a relationship-based society, not a rules-based society. Um, and this is a very, very old feature of China. Or, for example, uh, ancestral worship. Um, or an ideographic language. You know, one character system, many dialects, almost many languages. Um, uh, Chinese food, chops and things, tr traditional Chinese medicine. All of these things are products of Chinese civilization, of Chinese civilizational history. And here I think is absolutely critical. That if you look at Western countries, then Western countries are a 
21st century constituted on the basis of nation. But China as a country is constituted on the basis of civilization. This is a really profound difference between uh, China uh, and Western countries. So I personally uh, would argue that China is not primarily a nation state. It is primarily a civilization state. And only secondarily is it a nation state. A civilization state for three reasons. Firstly, because of its sheer longevity, which is what I've been talking about. Secondly, because for a long, very long historical period, the, um, the Chinese civilization coincided roughly with the borders of what was then China. And thirdly, of course, China is vast, geographically and demographically. Those four provinces there are the size of the same population as the United States. Those nine provinces have a population um, as large as or larger than that of, for example, France or, or the UK. And China is, as you would expect, although we often think of it for some reason in rather homogeneous terms, um, it's extremely diverse. And well, there's the richest uh, province, uh, Shanghai, and Gansu uh, is one of the poorest provinces in China. And there are great, uh, not just economic differences or social differences, but also uh, political differences and cultural differences across this you know, vast um, continent. So it's actually not possible to govern China, and never has been possible to govern China from Beijing or wherever the capital has been. You know, the power of the center is in a country of this scale is inevitably uh, strictly limited. And provincial governments, for example, the big ones, have powers which are much greater than the vast majority of nation states uh, in the world. Now, what does all this mean in terms of trying to make sense of China? Let me give you, um, uh, uh, well, two examples of how to begin to think about China in, 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 as, a, as a civilization state in practice. One is that the most important political value for the Chinese is unity. Now, this is not just for the government or the leaders, that kind of thing, but every Chinese knows this. Now, the reason unity is so important for the Chinese is because, historically, um, it's been through very difficult periods of disunity. Now, pause for a moment and compare this with Europe. Now, if you go back 2,000 years, Europe was united in the Holy Roman Empire, plus bits of North Africa, Mesopotamia, and so on, and China was just beginning the process of unification. And then over the next 2,000 years, China became united, and Europe broke down, but fragmented into lots of different territories, and today, into nation states. So the default mode of China is this huge country for the last 2,000 years, most of the last 2,000 years. The default mode of Europe has been this division into many different uh, territories. Now, the consequence of this for, the, for China has been that it's extremely difficult to hold a country together. I mean, if you've got a country of this scale, then imagine what the centrifugal forces are that are pulling the country apart. And China's history, essentially, I think, is marked by this conflict between the centrifugal forces and the centrifugal forces that hold it together. So when China's doing well, the centrifugal forces are on top. When China is doing badly, the centrifugal forces come to predominate, as they did from the, the opening wars in the 1840s through to 1949 and Mao's revolution. That was a period where centrifugal China was pulled apart, it was fragmented, it was invaded, there was civil war, there was all, many, many, many problems during uh, this uh, period. So for the Chinese, when, you know, this idea of unity is fundamental because the worst periods of Chinese history have been associated with disunity. But not just unity, the idea, the mantra in the Chinese mind, unity, order, stability. It's not a quirk of the present regime in China. This is 
a feature of Chinese history. So that's one example I would uh, I would give. Um, now the second example um, I want to to take is uh, about China and, and how to understand China uh, is about um, how what China what sort of power China is how is it likely to behave uh, as it becomes an increasingly important player in the world and in my view it will become uh, the predominant player in the world over time. Now, we, we, I think it's important to remember that China never colonized. It had no colonial, it had no colonial empire. The only way, the only aspect of Chinese history where you could argue there was a, a, a colonial element to it was the expansion of the Qing dynasty uh, towards, across, westwards, uh, across the continent. Um, from the mid 17th century to the early 18th century. But for example, the Chinese never invaded Southeast Asia. I mean, it had the resources, it had the power, it, could, uh, it, it had the ships, it could easily have achieved this, but it didn't seem to do this. And the question is why? Well, the reason is that uh, the Chinese had a very different view to the Western view. They both had a universal sense of themselves. They both thought they were, you know, the cat's whiskers, the best, the most advanced form in their respective historical periods. They were the, they were the most advanced form of, 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 of models in the world. But for the Europeans, it took them back, it took them after the discoveries around the world in the process of conquest to civilize the uncivilized. That, that never happened with the Chinese. Why? Because the Chinese mentality was very, very different. The Chinese ment mentality is, this is the center of the world, we are the middle kingdom, which is what you know, the center of the world all means, and we are the land under heaven. So why would we want to leave the most advanced form of civilization? Why would we want to step out of civilization into darkening shades <coughs> of barbarianism, which is how the Chinese used to see it? Yeah, the, the outside world. So actually, unlike Europe, unlike the Western tradition, the Chinese tradition of universalism was a stay-at-home tradition. And this was reinforced by the fact that a country of this extremely scale <coughs> is extremely difficult to govern. So unlike running even a country like Belgium, which I know is complicated, but it's extremely small, um, or running Britain, or running America, is a dog is so easy compared with governing China. So all Chinese rulers down the ages, from the imperial period and the communist period, have been hugely preoccupied with domestic problems, domestic issues. So I would suggest, actually, that to think of China as a global power, it will be a very different kind of global power to the Western tradition. It will be, don't expect China to ring the world with military bases. Again, I don't think that's the way the Chinese expansionism will work. Economic will be very important. Now, I've got about three minutes left. Okay. I'll turn that back. Um, I enjoy. Thirdly, the third point I'll briefly make, and then I'll, 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 I'll just conclude. And that is, you know, what do you think about Chinese government? We think that the great Achilles heel of China is its government. Okay. So. We've always thought this period will come to an end, this extraordinary period of growth, because at the end of the day, the government does not enjoy legitimacy. That is the way Westerners knew China. True? Mm. I think so. Well, there'll be some exceptions, good, I don't hear it. But by and large, that's the way we think. Now, there's a problem. So, and why, why do we think this? Because we think that the legitimacy of government flows from democracy. It's about universal suffrage and multi-party system. Now, there is a problem with this, and that is, you know, I would argue that the Chinese government, notwithstanding all the mass incidents and the rest of it, notwithstanding the corruption and so on, endures great legitimacy amongst the Chinese. Look, I'll just show you this. I didn't do this, never mind. But these are 
these, these are some statistics, some uh, sort of opinion data by Tony Sedge at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And on the left hand line, the blue, blue line, you can see it, is levels of satisfaction with central government. And if you look at the, uh, the Pew data for uh, uh, the Pew Global Attitudes data, you'll see levels of satisfaction in Chinese government are very, very high. Now, how do we explain this? I think we explain it in three ways. First of all, the Chinese see the Chinese state in a completely different way to the way we Westerners see the state. They see the state as the protector, the defender, the embodiment, the epitome of Chinese civilization. It is about the history of Chinese civilization and the unity of that civilization. That could not be true of the rest because we're not civilization states in anything like this. Secondly, the Chinese, uh, we, we see the state as uh, 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 instrumentalist and utilitarian terms. What would it do for us? Chinese don't really see the state like that. They see the state in familial terms. The, the state, you know, Confucius, the, the emperor should model himself on the head of the family. Another name in Chinese for the, for the nation of the country is family state, family state or family country. So the Chinese view of the state is not as some external agency as we see it, but is a, in, a view of intimacy, a, a familial view of what it is. So they even see it in some senses and its extension of themselves. That doesn't mean they don't overthrow it. China has a history of revolutions, but once it's overthrown and a new go a government system is constituted, it carries on enjoying this kind of authority. So there we are. Um, there's a, there's a, a brief introduction to three, I could go on with uh, two or three more uh, of these concepts, but uh, what I want to introduce you to is the idea that, Chi that if, we, if we're going to understand China, it's a very, very different uh, set of propositions. So it's a very different paradigm to that that we're used to uh, in the West. So I think with that, I'd better stop and wait for my elaboration. <laughs> Often people say, um, well, it's very frequent, you know, they express great surprise about what's happened in China since 1978, uh, the extraordinary rapid economic growth and so on, and uh, 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 also uh, a certain degree of um, shock that somehow or other it's not come to an end, and an expectation that it will probably come to an end, and you know, I gave some arguments about you know, why people uh, thought that. But maybe, you know, maybe there's another way of looking at China's rise. Um, maybe the period since 1978 should not be regarded as odd or unusual. Maybe the really weird period of Chinese history was the period between the 1840s and uh, 1949, China's century of humiliation. Because if you look about, if you look at China historically over a very, very long period, 2,000 years, then China has been very successful, historically speaking, on on uh, not one for one period, but for several periods. You know, during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, then later in the Song Dynasty, and we were just talking about this, you know, the, the Chinese will argue and say that uh, with serious foundation uh, that the inventions of the Song Dynasty in the 12th and 13th centuries were essentially, with minor, often quite minor changes, the inventions that uh, were used by Europe in the Industrial Revolution uh, several centuries later. And then the Ming Dynasty, uh, and the Qing dynasty. You know, China has been a remarkably successful civilization uh, in many respects. Um, and you know, uh, this, this, this is, uh, to illustrate the point here, um, uh, do you know what the big ship is in the background? Mm. I heard someone get you right. Zhou He, yeah. Zhou He sailed in something like this. I mean, there actually aren't proper drawings of it and so on. But Zhang He sailed in this ship uh, in the first 30 years of the 15th century 
across the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and across the Indian Ocean to, um, to East Africa. I mean, some people argue they went further, but it, it doesn't matter. Uh, this was a remarkable, a remarkable achievement. And you see that sort of dinghy in the front. Do you know what that is? That is, that is what Christopher Columbus sailed 80 years later, 80 years later, to discover America. Mary Indians, of course, didn't know that America, I suppose. But to this, so this is an illustration. Let me just give you one, another example. Um, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, the color is largely bled out of this light, but this is a, a silk scroll from about the 1360s uh, by Jujo. Um, and if you look carefully, the Scottish did not invent golf after all. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, China, China is a very rich civilization. So, maybe if you take the long historical view as opposed to the short historical view of this century or this, you know, the last couple of centuries, then we shouldn't be surprised. We should not be surprised that China has uh, been very successful. Uh, is being very successful again. And our surprise should be, why didn't it happen earlier, not why is it happening now? This is another way of looking at it. Now, <coughs> um, okay, so very quickly, let's, you know, the, the, the period since 1978 has been an extraordinary period. Um, we've never seen the like of it before. Uh, a country with a population of 1.3 billion people uh, growing at 10% a year for over 30 years. Starting off in 1978 with an economy one twentieth the size of the American economy, and today with an economy which is around half the size of the American economy, uh, and uh, closing fast. We've never ever seen anything like this before. And uh, uh, with the financial crisis, I mean, this actually accelerated the process of China's rise. Uh, in another slide for you, please. Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the left-hand uh, side, uh, ground zero, as it were, is the size of Western economies uh, as they were uh, in the first quarter of 2008. And on the right hand, not quite, you can't quite go all the way there. But uh, if you just do that, you see it. You, don't. Um, you can see it in 2011. And most Western economies, and certainly all European economies, are smaller now, as you know, than they were on the eve of the financial crisis. <coughs> now we see superimposed China's performance over the same period, and China's economy is over one third bigger in that time period compared with what it was in 2008. What's the consequence? The consequence is there's been a major shift in the center of gravity of the global economy from west to east, from the United States to China. So in 2007, Goldman Sachs projected that the Chinese economy would overtake the size of the American economy in 2027. And now the projection is 2018, which is sort of just down the road, you know. So, so and you can see in all sorts of ways now how China is becoming a very serious player. I mean, it's the biggest trading nation in the world. It now counts amongst uh, many, many countries all around the world, not just in East Asia, can China as their, as their biggest trading partner. China's become a major uh, 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 source of finance. I mean, in 2009 and 2010, it led more two Chinese banks, uh, led the uh, China Development Bank and the China Export Import Bank, led more to the developing world than the World Bank. And you can see also the renminbi, which is not a convertible currency yet, but is available, it can be used for the pay in the payment and some of the trade is beginning beginning to be a really significant country, uh, uh, currency. And you can see major financial centers around the world queuing up to be granted special dispensation uh, for um, the revenue fee. So, you know, you, this, this, this picture, uh, I think you're all sort of familiar with this, but you're probably not so familiar with this, uh, which is sort of just raise the time Right, raise the time horizons a bit, yeah? And uh, you'll see here, um, if you look at, uh, just draw your attention to China in 1820. And it was, it, it accounted for one third of global uh, GDP. 
Um, and, then, uh, and then it had this catastrophic decline I was referring to earlier, uh, where it, eventually it sank to 4.6% of global GDP, and then it started to rise again. Now, what I really, why I'm really showing you this part of a bit of history is to look at 2030. And in 2030, these projections by a Chinese economist who I've got, but there's plenty of predictions by America, and so on, are not dissimilar to this. And the projection is that China will account for one third of global GDP again uh, in 2030. And if you look carefully there, the projection is that the Chinese economy will be twice the size of the American economy in 2030, which is about 18 years down the road and uh, will be bigger than the American economy and the European economy uh, put uh, together. And I think the, the interesting thing about this is to imagine what the world will be like you know, in a situation like this. Of course, China will still be much poorer in terms of per capita GDP, but it will have uh, a, 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 a colossal economy. I mean, I, I, I put this together, which is, so you can't really see the silver, Bubbles very clearly, but just a, a, a way of illustrating the rise of China compared with the United States. Uh, the, the top line is GDP by exchange rates, the bottom line by GDP. And you'll see uh, there, there they start 2000, and the um, American economy is, is a lot larger than the, the Chinese economy, and the, the process of, of change over time you know, is really. Uh, really uh, striking. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, you can see China's economy much uh, rising. And this is part of, I mean, I, I like this map here. This is, this is a, a map put together by Danny Kwa, who's a professor of economics at the School of Economics. And uh, he, he, the t what he wanted to do was to try and work out where the center of the global economy was and how it was shifting. Um, so it's quite a complicated mathematical task, but uh, he, he situated the epicenter of the global economy in 1980, uh, just here. Yeah. And, uh, and then over time, over time, uh, he's, he's, he now, he argues that now it's about there, just about around there. And by 2050, he has it on the Chinese-Indian border. Um, so you can see an extraordinary shift taking place. I mean, for so long, for, you know, the best part of 200 years, the center of the global economy was the transatlantic economy, America. Um, and now it is shifting back historically to where it used to be. I mean, for many centuries, it was when the world was most populated, which was uh, in, on the Asian, uh, on the Asian uh, mainland. Now, the consequences of this uh, are, 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 are going to be huge. I mean, this is another uh, uh, um, uh, 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 interesting uh, shift, um, which is in the 1970s, um, the rich world, the developed world, was accounted for two thirds of global output of GDP, and the developing world accounted for only, for only one third of global GDP. By the turn of the century, it was roughly 50 50. And now it's a bit, a bit uh, the, the, the developing world accounts for a bit more than the developed world. And the projection is, the widespread projection is this, that by uh, 2030, the developing world will account for two thirds of global GDP. So there's a huge historic shift taking place, of which China is the outstanding example, uh, but it is, it is only an example of a much uh, broader change. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what I think about this. I think this is extraordinarily good and positive. Because you, know, you, had a, you had a situation where 15% um, of the world's population, which is, only, which is what the developed world was, um, had two thirds of the global income. And 85% of the world's population, this is the mid 70s, only commanded uh, a third of global GDP. 
And so... Still going to be poor. Hmm? They're still going to be poor. They're still... <coughs> but less poor than they used to. And, and, and all, the problem, the, the problem is, if you're, if, if, if you're, if you lack economic strength, uh, uh, then you will lack political rights. And so, for a long time, uh, basically, these parts of the world, these cultures and peoples, were uh, largely ignored. So, I regard this shift that's taken place now to be, you know, a, a, an probably the most important single act of democratization globally in the last uh, two hundred. Yes. <coughs> now, obviously, the implications of all this, you know, are uh, are, 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 are many. The world is going to become, let's face it, it's going to look like a very different place, and um, it's no longer going to be sort of run by us uh, as it has been uh, for such a long time. It's become, going to become less and less familiar to us, and it's going to become more shaped by. Uh, cultures that we're unfamiliar with, but above all by China, I think it would be the most uh, uh, dramatic uh, illustration of this. We're going to, uh, and this process I think will be played out during the course of the, of the 21st century, of this century. It'll take, it won't suddenly happen, it, well some things will happen relatively quickly, but a lot of things will happen quite slowly. Uh, in my view, China's rise politically and uh, in other senses will be Relatively, it will take. It will be quite protracted for two key reasons. One, because China is still poor, even though it's got a huge GDP in 2030, you know, twice the size of America, it will still be a relatively poor country compared to the United States. And poor countries cannot, beyond the point, exercise that much influence in all sorts of areas. But you know, it, but nonetheless, China will. You know, we'll all be learning Chinese and so on. Uh, so there will there, there will be elements of that. And the other reason I think it will be protracted, the rise of China's broad influence, and that is for 200 years we've lived in a world which has been dominated by <coughs> the West, first Europe, and secondly North America. Uh, China has been, uh, well, we've all been ignorant about China, of course. We know, well, we know why we've been so ignorant about China. So there's a fundamental lack of familiarity with things Chinese, you know, what is Chinese culture, what is Chinese history, what is the Chinese language, um, with, on, on, on all of these things and many other things, we don't know much about it. And that doesn't, doesn't go just for the West because it goes to the rest of the world because China wasn't very influential, influential with the rest of the world either. So the process of, if you like, cynicization of the world, which is what I think we'll be seeing, uh, increasingly, will, you know, it won't suddenly happen like that. It will happen over quite a long uh, protracted period. And I think with that, I shall stop my elaboration. And I haven't had a note telling me to stop. Thank you. <laughs>